Today, I'm going to talk about virtual reality's gender problem. And I'm going to draw from a project I was involved in called Vision for Women in VR, a project that I was involved in with King's College and the University of Brighton and a Canadian research organization and advocacy team called Refig. But I will start, to put it in context, with a bit of background on me. So I actually started my journey into the world of VR by producing. I produced two of the BBC's first virtual reality experiences, Easterizing Voices of a Rebel, a history documentary in VR, and No Small Talk, a chat show aimed at millennial women in 360 video. I loved making these pieces and put blood, sweat, and tears into those projects. But to be honest, I got a bit frustrated as well. More on launch that I had these ideas in mind of who would be doing our VR experiences we were making. They would be either history enthusiasts for Voice of a Rebel or millennial women for No Small Talk. And I had them in mind, we launched, and the frustrating thing was that those audiences didn't have headsets yet. And to be honest, they still don't have headsets yet. So I actually, I channeled that frustration. I channeled it into my company, my startup, Liminar Immersive. What we do is we bring virtual reality to broader audiences. And the way that we do that is by working with arts venues, heritage venues, and cultural venues. Venues that have got existing audiences. We screen VR with them by setting up something called a virtual reality theater with them um, and give them everything they need in order to to screen it and to put it on in the best way possible with a real sense of duty of care. These are some of the fantastic venues that we've worked with. And really, normalizing VR is what we're about. We're about finding a pocket of time, time and a place where it just feels like a standard thing to do to experience artistic VR. We're meeting audiences in the middle by, say, framing it as something you might do on a Tuesday evening or a Saturday afternoon. So now, moving on to that gender problem. I'll start off with what attracted me to working in the field. Now, here's a commercial reason. VR is predicted to be big. It's predicted to be really big. If these predictions that many analysts and commentators uh, have predicted come true, then it will sit alongside the cultural heavyweights of cinema, of radio, of television, even books, theater. It'll become something which is just a normal, ubiquitous part of everyday life. Even by 2020, it is predicted that the VR content market will take in $14 billion in revenue. That's $1 billion more than the US box office currently takes for movies. And in the UK, it's a really big part of a government's industrial strategy called Audiences of the Future part. But really, what gets me up in the morning <laughs> is the creative power of VR. It's really exciting how you can bottle up human experience and scale it to lots and lots of people. What is virtual reality if not one grand illusion? An illusion, essentially, you put a headset on your face and you're in another place or another time or you're meeting people that aren't really there. It's not really, to me, even about headsets, but it's about a whole new conceptual framework of delivering media. It's simulated first-hand experience. I think when, say, in the future, we'll probably look back and be really surprised and perplexed that we spent so much of our waking hours staring at these glowing rectangles. But where are we right now? Well, you're probably familiar with this technology adoption curve. We are here just between the early adopters and going into the early majority. And I'll come back to this later. So VR, we've talked about this, it's really rather powerful. And as a producer of virtual reality in the past, I can tell you, it almost feels a bit godlike. You're creating a sliver of world for audiences to inhabit, to spend time in, that you have ultimate control over. With a film, the director, the creator, they control the perspective of the audience, the lens that they see the world through in order to tell a story. With apps, they often are about creators making something for people to organize their, their own worlds. But with VR, it's a bit different. The creators actually make that world. 
They make the space, they design the rules, they design the, the social interactions, the physics, even the people that you meet. As I say, it's godlike. And here's the problem. The industry right now is mainly made up of men. This statistic, it's depressing. But at the moment, only 14% of UK VR companies have any female directors. Let's explore that a bit more. These worlds that we've been talking about are crafted through a male perspective. And this, of course, isn't new. This is just following the tech status quo. Men are not just making these worlds, though, and creating these experiences, but we're talking about an industry level. They're defining the early stages of this industry. They're defining the industry's place in society. Who does it? Where? Why might they do this? They're defining what success is. The grammar, the language of communication in this new form. In a VR space, if you've been into one, the chances are that you've been into a man's world. A man's world built mainly by men for men. Now, here's the audience angle. Only 14% 14, only 14 of UK women have experienced virtual reality versus 20% of men. There's a gender gap there, too, in audiences. And as we all know, what often shapes the development of new technologies, new media, is its early adopters and those early adopters' preferences. So it's clear that if things don't change, this new medium, as it develops, will be riddled with blind spots and male bias both, co bias, both conscious and unconscious. And actually, we're seeing this effect already. For instance, in the form of stereotypes, even if you've never done virtual reality, you will probably be aware of these stereotypes. <laughs> and this is what Limina's audience think VR is beforehand, but they, before they come to our events. This is the idea that they have of it. And it's actually something that we have to work quite hard to counteract, to show that, no, this is something for you. This is something that you can have permission to do. <laughs> so yes, while on the surface, these kind of uh, images feel quite funny. <laughs> They're actually really, really hard for us to deal with when you're trying to frame virtual reality differently and open it up to broader audiences. And then it's not just perceptions as well, but it's something that affects regular VR users on a regular basis. If you're a woman who's done virtual reality regularly and gone into these multi-user VR spaces, there's a quite high likelihood that you will have been sexually harassed. So we're already seeing the impact of this inbuilt bias. It is actively harming female VR users. So back to this adoption curve again. Let me be frank. We are having trouble crossing this chasm as an industry right now, going from early adopters into something where VR reaches the mainstream. I've been asked quite a few times recently by the press to go on air and defend the whole of VR, to basically explain why, no, it's not dead. And doing that, I mean, it's quite strange going on, say, the Today programme and explaining why uh, your whole career does have some potential <laughs> and VR isn't dead. But it's got me thinking. It's got me thinking, actually, what will determine VR's success? What will determine whether or not it succeeds or dies? Well, it's gender diversity. It's if we have teams that reflect the population. The odds of creating a product that appeal to the mainstream public and getting that product market fit are much higher if you have a team which is reflective of a population. But unfortunately, right now, in the world of VR, and actually many other forms of innovation, teams are overwhelmingly male. If we carry on at this rate and have such undiverse teams in the world of VR, we will not cross this chasm. No wonder. Zoom out. Look at other industries. There are so many failures that get swept under the carpet. And then innovation failures that actually are expensive white elephants. I could name quite a few. Study after study shows that diverse teams are more successful. So, for instance, Boston Consultants Group recently found that if you have increased diversity in your leadership, you've got more chance of making something innovative, successful, and financially successful too. 
McKinsey, they examined over a thousand companies and they found that firms in the top quarter for gender diversity were 21% more likely to have above average profitability. And this myth that our brains, women's brains are wired differently, is harming innovation because it stops women thinking that this is a space maybe that they're suited to entering into. Angela Saini and Cordelia Fine, for instance, are challenging this phony science that men are from Mars and women are from Venus and with their incredible best-selling books, but there is a way to go. Back to VR, another harmful myth comes from that boys' toys stereotype. Women, as I mentioned, that come to our events say that it actively puts them off virtual reality, those stereotypes. It is an anti-marketing tool. At a time when VR could go either way, it is just as likely to succeed as it is to fail. We can't afford to lose half our audience, or almost half our audience, before we're even started. <laughs> VR is really weird. It doesn't have a time and a place that feels like a natural time in our lives yet. But surely if we have more voices in the conversation, we're much more likely to find that fit. But there's good news. <laughs> VR is really new. It's malleable. Its rules and norms are still being shaped. There is still so much potential. On paper, we have a more equal society than humans have done for millennia. So surely this can be reflected in the development of a new communications medium. Let's get it right this time. Let's take this golden opportunity that we have to learn from the mistakes of the past. For instance, from Hollywood, from Silicon Valley. Now is the time to grasp this opportunity. And in the UK, a group of us, we have made a start. We have at least started the conversation, finding a way for our voices to be heard. We got together 20 influential women across the UK's virtual reality sector. We were supported and facilitated by Dr. Sarah Atkinson of King's College London and Helen Kennedy from the University of Brighton. And we wrote the vision for women and virtual reality. And it's now out to the world, so you can check it out and see what we have to say. You can see our optimistic perspective on where things could go. It's bwvr.org. Um, and we just really hope that it will be a useful and optimistic tool. So thank you so much for hearing this perspective. The VR gender gap is depressing, and it does exist. We've done the research now to show that it exists. It will be a challenge to change, but we're standing on the shoulders of giants because there have been women pioneers from the early days of virtual reality who have carved out the space. And that's where I go. I look to the work of women from the 80s and 90s and the noughties in the VR sector for inspiration, for motivation. That's where I look to, and that's where I draw strength from. And us, the women of UK VR right now, and the women in VR right generally, we are smashing it, actually. Wish us luck as we grow and shape this new medium for the better. Thank you.